Hello, I'm Robert Dakota of Worldviews Media, and I'm here to introduce you to Hugh Newman and J.J. Ainsworth. They're both megalithic maniacs. Is that a good thing to say? I hope that's politically correct. That, that is politically correct, yeah, yeah. Megalithomaniacs, that's the one. Megalithomaniacs. Um, <laughs> And they're going to be presenting at the Earth Origins event, and I'm really excited to have them there. They're here with us in this interview for all the way from the UK. So welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. Thanks for having us. Um, so I just wanted to uh, quickly get a little background, um, how you guys got started in all this, and uh, what what keeps you going? What's your passion that makes you interested in the ancient civilizations um i'll jump in there yeah i mean i'm basically uh, an obsessive megalithomaniac uh, ancient mysteries researcher uh, i personally got into this through the um strange things we find in the fields of england called crop circles uh they kept occurring in the late in the 1990s and i kind of became slightly obsessed by them that drew me into the whole earth mysteries megalithic culture in the west country where i live now and um, it kind of, you know, just turned me into a megalithomaniac and I became obsessed with all the different disciplines, especially at the beginning, like earth energies, um, the sacred geometry and the hidden, the hidden aspects of these megalithic sites and the astronomy and uh, ley lines and other such things. And uh, from that, I really got into the whole kind of earth grid theory, this sort of geometric earth sort of philosophy and uh, I wrote a book about that but since then it's just been a whirlwind of traveling and exploring and, um, and then meeting JJ and we've just continued doing this you know really and uh, you know we now do you know I've been running conferences and tours based upon these amazing subjects. And I got interested in this kind of stuff because my father was I sort of inherited it and I'm just on the chase for finding out what the mystery of the past was. I particularly like ancient symbols and connecting them between cultures across the world where there was, you know, mainstream tells us there was no connection. I think there was, there's a lot of proof for that. And um, when we go to Chaco Canyon, I'll be able to explain several aspects of that to the people that visit with us. But yeah, so I've inherited it. I love it. I'm, it's a passion in me, like I wake up for it, to research megalithic sites, the symbols associated with them, and I just love it. And I hope other people get more interested in it as well. More people, the more answers we get. Yeah, and how did you guys meet? <laughs> uh, yeah, we met at a, um, we met in Arkansas. It was actually at, um, at the, this brilliant conference, Earthkeeper Conference, put on by J James James Tiburon, mm -hmm. um, and we met there. I, I was speaking there. Um, JJ was, you know, at the conference. It's a local area, that's where she's from. That kind of area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so uh, and, um, and that was that was that basically. So since then, you know, that was back in late 2015. Since then, we've been just exploring, researching, and just uh, on a mission to, you know, uncover these ancient secrets. Yeah, I, I've, uh, I've, when I've been out traveling, one of the things that I noticed the most was the symbols. And I kept seeing symbols in different cultures and different countries, like the swastika, for example. Uh, Native Americans had the swastika symbol as part of their culture. And I thought, wow, how is that even possible? But I really do believe that we're, we have more in common than we have in difference. And we definitely were, it seems like we were more connected along the way somewhere in, in the ancient past. Oh, definitely. The swastika is found all over the world in ancient cultures. There's variations of it, but when I research it, the, the symbolism of it, it seems to me like the travel. It means to travel or to go places. It's like a spinning sort of symbol. And so I think a very long time ago, thousands of thousands of years ago, there was an original culture that was able to somehow go around a lost civilization that sort of left um, symbols that are still used today. We know that religious or 
cultish symbols are the ones that remain the strongest through time. So those are the ones that I look at that I can try to connect a complex set between cultures to prove existence at one time between them. It's um, a complex process, but it can be shown that there are connections between Siberia, Orkney, the US, if we just take the time to actually look and do the research. Mainstream archaeologists generally stay in small areas. They don't really get to travel as much as explorers do. And so they don't get to see as much. So when you're hands-on going to the sites, you can actually see it, do the history there and pinpoint, yeah, there was communication and travel before we were told there was. So I, I find it really fascinating. And the area in, um, that we're going to be visiting in Arizona, I mean, that is a hotbed of symbols that can connect people from millennia ago. So I'm really excited about going there. Yeah. Nice, nice. And what do you think, Hugh? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, JJ's really got me into the kind of whole subject of, you know, ancient symbolism and the deep meanings behind them. Um, uh, and I'm just fascinated because you just, you know, in Britain, for instance, uh, and places like Malta and Tiwanaku in Bolivia and all around the world, the certain symbols I keep spotting that keep keep popping up. We find the specifically we find like the spirals, the triple spirals, double spirals, sometimes quadruple spirals, often associated with the zigzags um, or like with lightning. Sometimes it looks like, mm -hmm. um, and we also have these unusual cut marks, which are like little scoops out out of the rock. Now. They're a well-known tradition in Britain. You know, many of these symbols occur in Britain and the Neolithic Bronze Age sites. But these cut marks uh, are actually being found at Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey, which is 12,000 years old, literally on top of some of the T pillars. Um, and so that really fascinated me. This almost like it was the origin point of this particular phenomenon. And so we find these cut marks not only there, but we find them in Britain. We find them in Europe. We've seen examples of them in places like Easter Island, even you know, South America as well, uh, amongst other places. So what's going on here? Why do they have this strange little technique of like carving these things out of stone? Uh, and then we find the same symbols everywhere around the world. It just gets weirder and weirder. And some of the stuff I know JJ is going to present at the conference is just going to blow your mind. It's just unbelievable. And people were just now coming round to this uh, reality that there's a lot more going on worldwide than we realize. And there's evidence to prove that. Yeah, the the one symbol you had on your picture there in Nevada, JJ, it kind of looks like a flower almost. Oh, yes, yes. It, that That's sun symbol or solar symbol. Uh -huh. It's a symbol we find around the world too. Um, and it's usually connected with the elite people or royal people. For In Assyria, um, they had it on, you know, there were some... I cannot remember exactly the, the name of the people. Um, they have these, people call them wristwatches or bracelets. And that symbol is carved on that, usually associated with that mysterious bag. Um, yeah. I don't know if you know. The <laughs> yeah. little medicine bag, what's in there? <laughs> exactly, that is the thing that I'm really interested in as many other people are. But yeah, the symbol um, in the picture you're speaking about is in Winnemucca. And at Winnemucca Lake petroglyphs, and those are dated to 14,800 years old. And they can do that because the site was submerged two times uh, beneath a lake called Lake Lahanaton. And so the University of Boulder, uh, Colorado, came down and did isotope analysis testing. And they put it that it could be 14,800 years old. And so Hugh was talking about the cup marks. Well, they have them on that side as well. Yeah. So 14,800 years old, that is amazing. That side is unbelievable. It's on a Paiute reservation. But their story, the Paiutes say that that is a magical area that was related to the red-haired giant cannibals. And you see the site, all of the carvings, the petroglyphs there are giant size. It's mind blowing when you go there and you visit it. 
And not only that, but it's on one giant, would have been one uh, tufa, tufa rock, one giant massive piece, which is a, sort of a limestone, but it's sort of broken apart. But when you go there, it's really majestic still after all of this time. And it, it, it is very, you must get permission when you visit it. And it does take a lot of time, but to go through the Paiute reservation to do so. And I got to visit because I'm a friends with a Paiute elder that was able to take me. So I was very blessed to be able to do that. But that site is amazing. And I'm gonna be presenting a lot of information from that site in comparison to other cultures around the world. I think the petroglyphs there are an ancient language. I've found the same symbols, the exact symbols, in Ireland at an ancient site called Loft Crew, which is dated to 5,500 years old. And those symbols are on one stone too, just like at um, Winnemucca Lake. And they're not just simple symbols, some of them are very complex. So statistically, there is a link there. We just have to sort of try and piece it together a little bit further to make the mainstream archaeology happy. But also, in Paraguay on one stone, I haven't visited this site yet. I've been to both the Nevada site and the Ireland site a few times. The same symbols are carved on that as well. And it's also associated with giants, like Loft Crew is associated with giants as well. So. We need to pay a little bit more attention to the myths that go along with these sites because they, they are sort of a bit tricky. If you listen to them, like for example, the Loft Crew site is associated with the giantess mm. who jump, jumps from one place to another, dropping giant stones from her apron. But the word apron, we went to go back and look what that really meant. Like, where did this word apron come from? And it's a Latin word, and it means map. <laughs> so the word apron, I know, I was very shocked too. So it's sort of a surveying. The apron was a map, and it was, you know, the story is it's dropping megaliths at sites. So it's like ancient surveying. If you have the ears to hear, the eyes to see, you really can just decipher history a bit better. It's really interesting and the story goes on and on. There's so much there. I mean, just to, you know, Jim and I, Jim Vieira and I is also going to be at your, your conference is, um, yeah, we're working on a book and this is partly what JJ was just mentioning about the giants of Britain. I mean, we've already written a book about the giants of America and there's a stunning amount of encoded information hidden in these myths and within the landscape itself. Um, and JJ just had the way her brilliant brain works. He just unlocks certain things that, you know, we, we may not see that the, the mere mortals don't see. And so, you know, it's just a case of like, you know, you know, working individually and collectively to kind of try and break these codes and try and understand what the ancients were really talking about. Um, and Britain is no exception. I mean, uh, I've been working on this chapter about Wales, the country Wales, um, in Britain and it's just blowing my mind because not only do we have hundreds of actual giant bones and skeletons being unearthed we have this hidden mythos which is like linked to geomancy and surveying the landscape and ley lines and the placement of stones in straight lines across vast distances and Pythagorean triangles and other such things. And it's, you know, it's partly connected with biblical traditions, even of Enoch possibly coming over to Britain. If you actually read the book of Enoch, you find all these connections with the Bible lands in Wales and Britain and directly linked with Stonehenge. And so people don't really realize that this is actually, you know, what's going on. And myself and Jim and JJ as well, we're kind of, getting deep into this research and we're going to be you know sharing as much as much of it as we can at, at the earth origins 2020 yeah i'm just having a flood of ideas come through i am having a hard time remembering keeping track of all the ideas that are popping up as you guys are speaking but the first one was back to that sort of flower symbol that looks like some kind of watch or maybe time traveler watch or something i don't know you see it on the sumerian uh guys with the wings mm. um, it reminds me kind of the imperial flower that you see in japan although there's 32 petals it just kind of reminds me of that 
was one thought that came through. And then the connections to the giants, there's stories about giants, uh, all these places I went to, Japan, Bali, New Zealand, Easter Island, Peru, Chile, of course here in the Southwest. But Okinawa, they, they had it enshrined on the primary school. Whoops. They had it enshrined on the primary school. They had it painted on the walls and they repeat these stories every year in festivities so that the next generation will remember them. Um, and then what was the other thing? Oh yeah, the first time I'd seen you, Hugh, was on Ancient Aliens when you were talking about those mounds and, and all of those uh, geoglyphs on all of those stones. They look like astronomical maps or something and how it all ties in across the globe is like really amazing. It's, it's a great mystery to, to try to solve. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. It takes um, a lot of effort. So whenever I was talking about mainstream archaeology, I really do appreciate the work they do. I don't mean to sort of demean them because really I don't. They do so much important things, but the fact is we do get to travel and explore. So when we have these ideas, um, for me, myself, I like physical ideas. Like I physical symbols on ancient artifacts that I can actually see and pinpoint. So I usually present evidence that is people can see and understand. And when you're talking about symbols, it's very difficult to do so without sort of a backdrop or a uh, slide. So I will have all of that ready whenever I give my talk in um, Sedona. Mm. But all of it seems to tie back to giants, which for me, I don't chase giants. I don't do that. But I come across it every, the further back in time with symbols I go, the more giant stories and myths I encounter, which I'm sure Hugh has a lot of information about that. Too much, too <laughs> much information. My, my brain is kind of overflowing because we're, in, we're, in, we're deep into this uh, that's why Jim's over here at the moment for a few weeks, just trying to finalize and finish this book about British giants. But it's, um, it's just, there seems to be some connection with that. There's always, you always come back, you know, the more you look into anything, it comes back to these myths and stories of giants. And you look more closely into the old records and you find bones and skeletons and skulls and teeth massively oversized found in most of these places. Mm -hmm worldwide and it's like well what's going on here i mean why isn't this part of our history why isn't any of this stuff like part of our kind of academic training even our schooling you know going back to when we were young i mean i've been we've been we're a big fan of this gentleman this researcher and writer called alan wilson which has been listening to him tonight we're going to go and meet him in a couple of weeks he's speaking at our conference in england and he's a brilliant historian i mean he's been ridiculed put down no one's you know no one's the academics ignore him but he's cracked you know he's cracked the real history he's translated all these welsh texts mm -hmm. um and it's people like that you know helping us actually you know see the light when it comes to our, our real history and he was telling he was telling in this uh, interview he was saying that um before the 1920s like i think it was around 1924 to 26 something like this the whole schooling in britain changed everything changed before that they were teaching some of the stuff we've been talking about today. They were teaching about mm. the, 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 the mystical origins of Britain with Brutus, the Trojan coming over, the stories of giants and other such things. And that everything shifted when the English kind of crown and government sort of pushed their way into Wales and it all got changed. And so even up to like less than 100 years ago, this, you know, some of the, you know, the most interesting information was present. And this is, I think this is why, um, it's, you've got to look into things from a different perspective and like dig out the old books, get things translated, you know, and don't rely on what, you know, contemporary authors are saying, actually go deeper, go further into the research and find out what the original sources are saying. I think, I think that's, that's the kind of uh, guideline we kind of work by nowadays to kind of, you know, find, and because we, you know, we push that, you know, we're pushing these boundaries. We're finding things that we don't think have ever been published. So we're, we're like very, very happy with where we're at with it. And we're going to keep going with it. Yeah. And it's with the old text, it's very important with etymology to see where they came from and what the word meant 
in that language like latin for example so mm -hmm. for me i always want to go back and go back and go back and see the words because it really changes what you're hearing the meaning of it so which is a breakthrough of a lot of the things that i've researched is actually taking the time to do um, the etymology background yeah, that's how I came through all this. Uh, I was studying theology and in graduate school for my, for my final thesis paper, I came across Genesis 614 talking about the Nephilim. And if you do the etymology on that, it's, it's gods with a small g. And that was strange because there's not supposed to be any other gods. There's only mm -hmm. supposed to be one god. So that's what piqued my curiosity. And if, if you don't do the etymology, you, you lose the content to the context of what you're looking at and what period you're looking at. Um, yeah, you're so, absolutely right. Completely right about that. Yeah. Yeah, but I've been, um, we've been looking, Jim and I and, and JJ, I've been looking into the, these old texts you're talking about, also the Book of Enoch, which absolutely fascinates me. I've yeah. become obsessed by that recently. Uh, there's also this other book called the Book of Giants, uh, which was found as part of the kind of Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and uh, and so, like, you start looking at those, and he's like, hang on a sec. The, the, the things that they're saying, they're just, matter of fact, talking about giants and these beings who kind of flew to different places and were surveying and all this kind of stuff, you know, in deep prehistory. Um, and then, you know, you, you, kind of, you kind of delve into that and work and, and, and sort of, break down you know where they're talking about because you know enoch's given descriptions of landscapes weather climate the lengths of days and nights and other such things making astronomical observations and people like robin heath and christopher knight robert lomas and others have actually worked out that they were talking about ancient britain where they came over to do this astronomical research so um and then you you know you kind of look around britain and wales and you find and you find the connection so the more you the more you look into it, it just gets weirder and weirder. Yeah, I like the saying from Mark Twain. That's why I put it on the promo video. Uh, that truth is stranger than fiction. It's <laughs> it's just bizarre. The more you look into it, you're like, wait a minute, this is like a sci-fi Twilight Zone movie. And I've grown up with these theories, sort uh, sources, stories, and comic books, media, movies. So if it's in our imagination, um, there must be something to it just on that alone. But also the mythology, when they keep repeating it in the metaphoric stories, they must be leaving it behind for some reason, not just a pretty story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the other things it kind of gets me is <clears throat> if you start looking into the old British traditions, you go to the time of the Druids, which is a couple of thousand years ago, uh, and even before then, there was no kind of, um, not, not specific writing was happening in language. It was more an oral tradition, passing down these very high-level, very sophisticated stories from generation to generation and they have these phenomenal memory techniques which is something that absolutely fascinates me and there's some modern research is actually being starting to decode that really um you know by looking at the way that the song lines of ancient australia where the native people there the aborigines would actually kind of within their own landscape they'll create stories and they become embedded in the landscape and it would actually guide them on roots mm -hmm. around their whole country even just by following the stories then it gives you clues to where to go next and other such things and the same kind of principles are at play everywhere even at megalithic sites and so that that started to really fascinate me the fact the way the ancients use their minds and it and it seems today we kind of you know we can't even drive to another town without using a GPS on our phone to get there, you know? So it's like, that's worrying. And so it's sort of, all this technology is great, but it's actually making us much more stupid. And so, um, you know, we have a lot, you know, the way the ancients were doing it, they would do it all within their own brilliant minds. Yeah, one of the fascinating things uh, from your work, I saw one of your videos talking about sort of the energy uh, coming out of the stones. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, sure. That's, that's something that's, that's that's really fascinated me for a long time. Is this uh, these natural kind of energies that form in the landscape, like these telluric currents, these uh, sort of yang yin and yang energy currents that move through the land, the underground water, the strange lights that often occur at these sites, these earth lights, and and these stone circles, as an example, you know, of a certain type of megalithic site, seem to kind of you know trap the energy there's there's proof now this has been documented scientifically that like the hinges like the ditches the circular ditches around stonehenge or avebury for instance anything that's cut three feet below the surface uh, these telluric currents only go to they're less than three feet they only sit around the surface area a couple of feet and so if you have a deeper hinge it will where the energy flows into it it will direct it round following the path of least resistance and then there'll be a flat entrance like the northeast entrance to stonehenge but also the summer solstice alignment and all the energy will just flow into it and hit all the stones and charge them up and this is like being proven you know there's been tests done multiple tests um electrical resistivity, resistivity surveys uh carried out by john burke and others mm. um have, have actually found this to be the case and so you know what's going on here you know is this is like the subtle kind of advanced technology of the ancients and these stones as well uh, many of them are kind of crystalline so you get the, you know the, obviously you get the piezoelectric effect of crystal crushing crystal and things like this and that can create electric charge and different different energies um, and many of the sites are built upon these what's called a conductivity discontinuity where there's two different types of geology meet at this particular spot and so the energy the the telluric currents and water and other such things moving through it would switch polarity between positive and negative and create sometimes create the, these spheres of light that you see a photograph on the surface mm -hmm. and that's where they would place these dolmens or megalithic sites to trap manipulate this energy and then they would go in there place their seeds and grains and they would get charged up they go and plant them and the yield will be three times as much as uh, a crop a seed that hadn't been placed there so you get these kind of things this is all but i'm just trying to summarize this super fast but this is like <clears throat> what is going on with these sites and they still work today that's what's even more amazing and um I know Freddie Silver's interested in this. He's going to be at your conference. He's very, yeah. very, very much on the same page on a few different aspects. But there's, there's much more to it than that. That's just, that's just the local kind of one site system. But, mm -hmm. you know, I believe that there's a whole system and all these sites spread out across a country were controlling these much larger earth energy currents over vast distances, possibly the planet, this is whole earth grid kind of theory. And they were creating this enchantment across the landscape, this sort of, this sort of fertilizing, en high energy, consciousness raising kind of field of energy everywhere. And so, and it was part of their kind of plan to like bring this, you know, to maintain this high level of consciousness. And so I think, you know, we as a you know culture in this day and age are just starting to probably in the last 50 years to understand this is the case because we know that all these sites encode very sophisticated geometry different really sophisticated measurement systems their placement on the landscape is all very geometric uh, based upon you know certain ancient principles and this all would you know contribute to this whole field of kind of energy across the landscape and i think there's i think there's a lot to be said about that it sounds like a bit wishy-washy like it's a bit kind of new age but the evidence you know if you look into it thoroughly enough is there and, and i think this is uh, definitely a reality wow yeah i was talking to freddie about this last week and he had said some things that i hadn't heard before but you just said some things that i hadn't heard before i mean just sort of being able to fertilize the agriculture, that's not only fascinating, but that's really pragmatic and um, important for our mar a modern day world. It's not just, you know, because people always ask me, uh, what's the importance of studying ancient history? I want something that's meaningful for me now. Mm. And this kind of information sounds to me like sort of a Tesla alternative electric, uh, electrical system that could have also been possibly protecting the planet even and 
communication, who knows, all kinds of possibilities. And if you look at it, the architecture alone, it makes us look kind of small or primitive in our, <laughs> in our modern day advancement. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's true. I, I I agree with what you're saying. It's like, um, you know, if you're, you know, for example, if you, you know, with if you're placing these grains and seeds, and these these sites still work now, and they were built several thousand years ago. Imagine what they were like when they were first built, and the whole system was up and running. I mean, this is this whole idea with the Great Pyramid that Chris Dunn has talked about. Um, um, and he, uh, his theory, I a hundred percent, you know, support. And it's like the same principle when it's all up and running, we don't, we have no idea what, you know, what it could have felt like and what it would be like to live in those times. And, you know, and I think, you know, with the, especially just the seeds, the pragmatic, the, the grains and other such things, the pragma pragmatic aspect of that is that we can replace GM instantly. You know, we, if we could just utilize, build a thousand dolmens in every town, you know, you just sort of take it down to your dolmen at the end of the garden. As long as you pick the right spot, you get your geomancer a friend, you know, my buddy Sean Kerwin will come in, douse the energy lines, find the right spot to put it you know place your seeds in they're all charged up you get three times the yield and so on and so forth and so you know i know john burke who was developing this he actually had a company called seed tech uh, he unfortunately died before it really took off but this would have challenged gm worldwide you know wow. for, for you know for advanced food production any climate any any part of the world and so there is something pragmatic and useful for today to be found you know in studying these ancient mysteries and dolmens are found around the world everywhere. And South Korea, which I hope to go to sometime soon, has two thirds of the world's dolmens. And a lot of people don't know that. Uh. And Japan has dolmens, but they have some massive uh, dolmens, large capstones, unbelievable weight. I think one of the capstones, I don't know if it's in Japan or South Korea, is over 290 tons. So. Yeah, South Korea itself is just overflowing with dolmens. And it's just one of the places I think needs to be opened up a bit more to the Western world. Not that many people go there. If you order books on the ancient sites of South Korea, it's really hard to find some, isn't it? I think you ordered is, just yeah. Yeah, yeah a couple and they weren't really explaining too much. So I hope to get into that area and do a bit of research. Yeah, I mean, as JJ was mentioning, these these dolmens, I mean, we were just in Jordan recently, um, you know, we went to Petra, obviously, in places like this, but there were there were dolmen fields there, hundreds of them, you know, and like, well, what are they doing? Why are these? And all these are very much in the area of, like, Palestine, uh, going out to, you know, over the board, border with Jordan, and these are very much biblical, you know giant kind of dolmens that were kind of talked about in the old testament and earlier other books so you've got them there you've got them in you know korea japan there's in india they're in britain they're they're in north america there's a north salem dolmen in new york sardinia um sardinia we've got you know even south america we have san augustine there's dolmen type structures there um so we have to question that is it was this a worldwide kind of kind of effort that took place to kind of like, you know, to harness and work with these energies for pract practical as well as possibly, you know, more esoteric purposes. Wow. Uh, it, it just, again, ideas are sparking and turning. I've, I've had um, an older medicine man tell me that uh, when he was a kid, the grandparents used to have the children take seeds um, lick them, put them under their pillow for the night. The next day, go out, and uh, he would take them on a hike and ask them, what did they dream about the night before con concerning the seeds that they put on the, under the pillow? And then they would lick them again and plant the seeds, and he was claiming that it actually puts the DNA on the seed to um, inform the seed how to best nutrient your body oh, which that, that is interesting that's interesting yeah. now i found a new thing to research <laughs> so thank you <laughs> be yeah, doing the, that the rest of the night <laughs> the dolman thing about you know the seeds and and another thing i have a friend here i'm going to introduce you to um he's been into minerals stones the energy of stones since he was a child he's actually building 
a, um, a giant sweat lodge with giant stones that he's moving himself. Mm. And he's put quartz crystal under one of the largest stones that's lined up to the summer solstice and the doorway to the sweat lodge. And those quartz crystals, just from the, the weight of the stone, is creating that, that what you talked about, the piezoelectric yeah. energy, just from the crushing of the quartz crystal. He has copper under that that surrounds the sweat lodge behind the other stones. So he has a perfect ver verde cage, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, perfectly symb uh, symbolizes the frequency of the earth. It's not, it's not finished yet, but I'm, I'm going to show this place to you when you get here. Yeah, okay. that sounds really intriguing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But he talks about all these things about the energy of stones, and uh, that's why I wanted you to bring that topic up. And I did an interview with him that I'm going to add to the weekly podcast mm -hmm. uh, to add to this whole conversation building up to the events in May. Mm -hmm. So it's really exciting for me. Just even this small conversation, you know, it's like, whoa, the wheels are turning, the wheels are turning. There's a lot to think about. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, I mean, I think the lineup you've got for the conference is is excellent. It's yeah. a nice balance. It's really cool stuff. I think it's just, you know, you know, I would, you know, I would invite all these speakers to my conference if I could afford them. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Cremo is Michael Cremo. Yeah. Oh, he's great. Yeah, he stayed yeah. here before with us. Yeah, we took we took him to Stonehenge and everything. Yeah, yeah. So nice, it's nice. Be a, good, be a good one. Yeah, yeah. Across the board, I I like to see the diff, different different dis, disciplines and see them overlap because there's so many strange, varying stories. Even the 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 UFO stories, you know. Um, fit in there together with the dinosaurs somehow and all the giants and all the crazy stories. It's like, wait, are we living on the same planet? Uh <laughs> oh, I know. I'm one of the people that likes really solid physical evidence, but I've found at these ancient sites that there's some strange things occur that make me feel really uncomfortable. We've had a few instances that have occurred that are just just made me want to stop researching for a bit because of the things that we encounter in one place was Saturnia in yeah, Italy yeah. and I never want to go back there it was just frightening just unreal yes I mean so we've had very positive effects at sites where you kind of feel like this enchantment like you've kind of turned up at the right time there's mm -hmm. like this almost like divine energy can overtake you I've had that at a few different places on my travels but then you get the other side of it as well. So, you know, you've got to be a bit kind of cautious and almost like, you know, one of the things I always say is like you ask permission to enter sites just in your mind's eye and Absolutely. you get you know, to the guardians, the sort of spirit guardians of the site. I know it sounds a bit kind of new age or out there, but actually there's something in that. <laughs> you know, I think it's probably, you know, something indigenous cultures are probably aware of that these old sites have power. Uh, and we learned that the hard way in, um, this this place called Saturnia, where can, can I mention this? You, you can. <laughs> okay, uh, we we turned you know we turned we were driving to this very ancient site in Italy, and Italy is remarkable. I'm doing I've done a lot of research there. My good friend Gary Billcliffe has been researching there for many years, and Richard Casaro, and uh, me and JJ went there once or twice. Um, I went I went there 10, 10 or eleven years ago originally, back in two thousand and eight. And I went to this site called Saturnia then, and also a couple of years ago, and it's this very ancient burial ground. Saturnia is the oldest site in Italy, apparently, the oldest city built there. And it's got massive polygonal walls like you get in Peru around the perimeter. It's yeah. got this mystical quality to it. You have these burial kind of areas down in the kind of valleys nearby. And one of them we heard about, we couldn't find it though, is where giant bones were found. But we went to this other one, this other burial ground, and before half a mile before we got there, there was some kind of, I felt this sort of something in my solar plexus saying, hang on a sec, this is, whew, we've got to be careful here. This is like, 
you know, this is like a sort of, I thought it was like a sanctified site or something. So we got there. By the way, yeah. I laughed at him when he told me that. Whenever yeah. we were driving there, he said, wait a minute, I feel weird. And I was like, Shh, whatever, let's get to yeah. the site. So, yeah, so we, like, so we we pull up at the site, we kind of get our cameras, we get out of the car. Um, we both got to open the, the, the boot or the trunk, you call it in America. And we both just looked over to the site and this huge tree just broke in half and crashed down on one of the dolmens in front of our eyes. And we were like, what? And we were just, we, we just went, this is too weird. How could that happen? And we, we went over, you know, we went, we walked up, approached the site and thought, should we even go in here? Because I knew when I was there last time, it felt like there was something going on. It's like some kind of portal. Or ghosts were there or something bizarre. Um, and again, I laughed. At yeah. him, I was like, "Oh, it's a coincidence, whatever." <laughs> and I just go into the site, just go in there because you know it's an ancient site, and I love to just go through and explore. <laughs> uh, within about five minutes, she was sprinting out, screaming uh, <laughs> because there was like you could hear voices. There was like this bizarre oh. energy there. It was all kind of coming around us. It was just like you know, and I was sort of holding myself together, but having asked permission, I didn't. Get a yes or no, I just went in, and yeah, so, so the site's like this a bit weird. Then, next thing I know, JJ's hiding in the car, trembling, and she gets out and screams, Run! <laughs> and so, it it's, was horrible. There was some movement, in, in the, and we, we, we decided to leave after that um, because there's some strange stuff going on. And I've had other people who've kind of done some remote dowsing on it, and they they say it's like an it's like ancient black magic is over this particular place and you don't mess with it and it's like some kind of portal you know and so so there's this aspect of ancient sites that are going on as well i don't want to frighten people and stop, <laughs> stop them exploring because most of them are kind of clear and they're good um and uh, but you get these occasional powerful experiences either positive or negative that was very strong. It let me know that there's stuff out there that I don't understand. After we left, I was literally, I was crying. I've never had anything like that happen before. And um, it's kind of even embarrassing to tell it because if you haven't experienced it, I have the fear that somebody's going to laugh and not believe you. But as we were driving away, we were sort of talking back and forth did that just really happen? Was this real? We had to like question ourselves. Like, are we, did something happen? Are we, you know, because th th this tree, right. We, <laughs> we inspected it and it was a fresh tree. It was like something huge. It just tore it down, smashed it down. And, um, it was, it was utterly odd, but, but saying that there are, you know, people, you know, you should go to sites with a, you know, a happy vibe. Don't worry. Don't just maybe don't go to Saturnia. Um, don't go to Saturnia. There, there's other places to go. Um, Everywhere but, else is good. <laughs> yeah. There's many, many, you know, there's, I think these sites are there to inspire us. I think our mm -hmm. ancient ancestors partly built them to, uh, with compassion in mind, not just because they're like these devices where you can place your grains and seeds and, mm -hmm also affect your consciousness the same kind of energy can affect your consciousness it can bring kind of this sort of almost like kind of divine light feeling about you it can raise your kind of spiritual self if you like so there's these diff different parts you know different aspects to explore here whether it from the archaeological to the spiritual and everything in between Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that 100% because I came from the metaphysical side. I, I was having experiences when I was a kid and I was researching the spiritual material because I was trying to define what that is. And um, I find that all this is really true and especially, you know, exploring the sacred sites. I always try to bring a medicine person, or as you say, consciously when you enter these places, it's, it's not just a national park or something like that. It's some place where ancestors once dwelled, whoever's ancestors they were. And um, I discovered from the you know the native and in, in indigenous people that as long as you pay respect, ask for permission, and you'll get that intuition. You'll get the You'll get the hair on your neck or you'll get, hey, this feels like a, a good place to be. 
Um, but on our trip to Chaco Canyon in May after Earth Origins uh, and the tour around the Southwest, we were going to have some medicine people with us. And uh, back in 2018, when we went, we had them on the trip with us. And each place we asked permission and we did cleansing and uh, um, had the medicine people do protect protection for everyone going in. And I found that that went much better. It, it, it helped a lot. Uh, yeah. it's, it's no joke. It's, there's something to it for sure. Okay. Okay. And no, I know definitely it, it needs to be, you know, these sites are not to be sort of messed with. There's a, there's an element to them, you know, that we need to respect for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And gratitude goes a long way. If you feel like honored to be there and, and you have respect for the space and um, you'll have a good experience there. If it, it you know, it, more than likely usually, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, Tell me, have you been to Chaco Canyon before? Is this your um, first time, or have you been there before? I got um, I got halfway down the dirt track once, like about <laughs> ten years ago, and it was so muddy that I got trapped in the mud halfway down, like ten or fifteen miles down, and had to get towed out, and I couldn't quite get to Chaco Canyon. And then, so no, I, this is it. So I don't think it's going to be too muddy in may no good um so yes yeah, so, this will be technically my first time actually getting to the site but i've tried really hard weren't you using that david close. yeah and actually i was actually i, I rented david hatcher childress's truck from him <laughs> which i thought was a four-wheel drive and it wasn't so it's david childress's fault <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> that's funny all right so you're a virgin to chaco canyon then <laughs> Uh, yeah, you've been there, haven't you? No, no my no, daughter, can't. my daughter's been. Oh, Sorry. you haven't been either. Neither one. Wow, family, that's fantastic. Family members have been, and I've got halfway there in David Childress's rubbish truck, and you know, and that's that's it. So yeah, we've been. This is our chance. So thank you for accommodating that. <laughs> I'm excited to see the T-shaped windows and entrances because those, that is such an amazing symbol that the tea that is around the world as well and it's i think relates to the wind god or one of the wind deities or um actually just one of the biggest deities a lot of people don't know that but i've been researching that symbolism which goes all the way back to gobekli tepe and i can sort of form a line we were just discussing this about the mm -hmm. t-shaped uh symbol and i found israel um Egypt, North America, South America, Mongolia, uh, and many more other places have a T-shape. And a lot of them have the T-shape with sort of a dot, like at the, some people, like just right here, if you were a human, it would be here. And so there's a lot of artifacts showing that exact same symbol, the T, with the little dot right there, which I think is relating to the portal deity god, but it's a world, it's a world concept from ancient times and i'm going to present that research at sedona which i've not seen that shown anywhere else at least the details that i have found to be able to try to show a connection but i think that t-shape relates to a, a sort of a wind power deity which i'm really excited to go and finally visit the site <laughs> uh, interesting because uh, I, I had a medicine guy in Peru tell me his theory on the T-shaped things and the, the structures and stuff. His suggestion was or theory was that it was sort of for uh, tuning your head and that you put your head in it and kind of vocalize a certain tone and you could tone your head, uh, which I thought, hmm, okay, that's, that's an interesting theory. I, but well, you know that 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 really does make sense because um, in the cultures in South America and um, Central America, Mexico, uh, a lot of the like, for example, Pakal the Great from Palenque, um, they had masks like his barrel mask had a T shaped on the front where you would the elite would shave down the first uh, the front two teeth into a T 
So it looked like a little T. So when they speak, the wind would hit it. So that's how I really began researching the T shape as a wind cymatic sound sort of deity. So that makes perfect sense to me what he told you. <laughs> uh -huh. And what about uh, other places that we're going to go on on the Chaco trip, like, for example, Mesa Verde? Have you been there before? I think I've been to Mesa Verde, yeah. I've been to a few sites in that kind of area. Uh, again, this was uh, this is the, the doomed uh, David Hatch children's truck event when I was uh, not, been, not able to get to Chaco Canyon. But around that time, I visited quite a few sites. I've been to a couple since. Um, the main area, I mean, we've done, a, Jim and I have done a, quite a bit of research on the giants of the Southwest. So we'll certainly share all we've got from there because we found out a whole bunch of accounts and legends and stories that are just, just incredible. And this goes all the way, as JJ mentioned, into Nevada, uh, up to, you know, the whole Lovelock cave story and the, um, the Winnemucca petroglyphs and other such things. So there's, there's, there's a lot going on there, a lot of hidden a lot of hidden information so it's going to be very very exciting to get to explore there thoroughly nice and are there any other things like uh, we're going to go to canyon de Chez. um does that bring up anything to you I, the people were living up in the canyons and last time we went there i heard some of the stories were you know to hide from predators um to be up in the canyon was uh, kind of key well, there are, there are a lot of traditions from the area of like these, you know, um, kind of a, like a different type of giant who are kind of cannibalistic, you know, going way, way back. And there's a lot of stories that kind of talk about that. And uh, I don't think these were, you know, uh, local to that area. They may have come in from somewhere else, but you do, you do get that where people are actually terrified, not only of like uh, kind of wild beasts, but actually wild humans as well. And uh, that's one of the stories about Lovelock Cave, for instance, where you have the Saiti Ka or the, the red-haired cannibals who had to be defeated and, and, and taken out pretty much by the Paiutes uh, in Lovelock Cave itself. And so and they were thought to be giants. There were skeletons, bones, skulls unearthed of giant magnitude. So, you know, you do have these sort of strange stories that kind of talk about that. And, and certainly the Southwest is, you know, is rampant with these kind of uh, traditions. Oh, well, I'm excited to uh, do some camping at Chaco because that means we can really look at the stars. And uh, just a disclaimer for anyone coming on the trip that's not comfortable with camping, we will have hotels for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just, just being out overnight and having Gary David there, who knows so much about the night sky yeah. in the Southwest, and uh, also he knows so much uh, details and science about the math. Like, I think... Um, he was telling me that uh, just one section, one, one place out of Chaco Canyon took something like 52 million uh, pounds or, uh, of square block just to build one section of rock that they had to bring. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, they're bringing giant uh, pinion posts from 25 miles away. How are they doing that? And you know, when the kivas, all we see left over is the hole, but they had like 25, 50 foot store, uh, 50 foot, not stories, 50 foot ceilings like you find in Egypt. It must have been so majestic to come yeah. into that space, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by that place. I'm, I'm sort of desperate to, I've been desperate to go there since that terrible experience uh, 12 years ago um but i will get there with you so that's good mm -hmm. <laughs> nice i'm so happy to to know that uh we're gonna get you the first time there in 2020 of all years too so that mm -hmm. sounds like a good year to go absolutely yeah yeah well i could talk to you guys for a long time i mean i could sit here all day and i know you guys are at night in the uk and jj is going to catch a plane in the morning so Thank you so much for your time, taking the, the time to do this interview, and I'll cut it, and we'll get this out far and wide. So thank You're, you so much. Well, thanks so much, Rob. We really appreciate it. It's a fascinating conversation for us as well, and we can't wait for the Earth Origins Conference and the 
the Chaco Canyon Southwest Tour. I think they're both going to be amazing. Thanks very much. Thank you.